It's like everybody else is partying last night, too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so do you guys remember the three different memory stores for memory? No? Okay, we we'll have to... From 101 or did we cover it last week? Huh? Is this from 101? From 101. Or from last yeah. week? Oh, yeah, no, no. Anybody not taken 101? I haven't. You haven't, okay. So you have an excuse. Everybody else, so... <laughs> Put them in time out later. <laughs> All right, so... 20 some years. Oh, really? That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll give you a little stuff. leeway. <laughs> Does anybody remember what a memory store is? Where you store your memory. Yes, very good. Where you store your memory. Although, as a teacher, you know you're not allowed to define a def something with the words of the mm -hmm. definition itself. So, basically, it's a cluster of neurons in your brain that is dedicated to storing experiences and information that you've learned. So, a memory store, physiologically, You've got a network of neurons that are all connected. So you've got a spider web of neuronal connections. And research into our brain anatomy shows that there are three distinct memory stores. And they function with memory in different ways. So you probably have heard short term. Yeah? Yes. yeah. Okay. Long term. Uh, yeah. Oops, actually, I'm doing this wrong. But short term. Short term. Long term. And does anybody remember what the first one is? Sensory. Sensory memory. Okay. So when information comes into your senses, so you hear something, you feel something, you taste something, whatever sensory information, it goes first to your memory, your sensory memory store. So this cluster of neurons connects and holds on to this information. Whatever you are seeing, hearing, whether it's a class lecture or whether it's the taste of a pizza, that all gets stored in your sensory memory. Now, we are not consciously aware of our sensory memory. Sensory memory has basically a limitless capacity. Limitless. The capacity is limitless. It can hold a huge amount of information, which, of course, we are not, our brain is not capable of handling a limitless amount of information. So, in between sensory memory and short term memory, there is a filter. And our brain is capable of looking at what is important in this information and let's filter everything else out. Now, the duration of sensory memory is about one second. So, literally, it's in one ear, well, not literally exactly, but <laughs> close to literally, it's in one ear, out the other with sensory memory. Okay. It's in, it's out. If it's important, if we focus on it, it gets shuttled into short term memory. Okay. So this, the job of this filter is to determine, and it's not literally a filter, it's a whole system of the brain deciding what is important, but metaphorically it is a filter that only allows the important information to go through. And how does our brain determine if something's important? This is important for studying. Because you can try, you can convince your brain to retain the information you're studying better if you manipulate that filter the right way. So, what would make you pay attention to something? Interest. Interest. Okay. If it's interesting, then we should pay attention to it. Why did we pay attention to this? Because it's annoying. Huh? Because it's annoying. Because it's annoying. So if it's annoying, we also pay attention to it. What is the connection between both interesting and annoying? Uh, they are more stimulating. Annoyances are more stimulating. It's more stimulating. Okay, so it causes um, an emotional reaction. Causes an adrenaline release, or more properly, epinephrine. If you're English, you call it adrenaline. If you're American, it's epinephrine. Although common people just refer to it as adrenaline anyways. Um, so if 
it causes an adrenaline release, even a slight adrenaline release, like hearing an annoying disturbance, then your brain goes, that could be important. That could kill you. If it's getting the, your body to react, then we need to pay attention to this. And so it immediately gets put into short-term uh, memory, which is the only store that you have conscious awareness of. If you are thinking of something, it is in your short-term memory. So, if you are bored out of your mind with your studying, how well are you going to remember it? Not very well. Not very well. So you have to figure out how to make it interesting. Or you have to figure out how to just make your adrenaline go up. So you could study and exercise. This is why you should take breaks every once in a while and get your blood moving again. Because you get some adrenaline pumping and your brain goes, oh, let's pay attention to this. Okay? It's also why you eat junk food when you're studying. Because sugar causes an adrenaline release. And so even though it's not the studying that's causing the adrenaline, your brain will still pay attention more. Really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I've got to put away the nuts and grab some ho-hos or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's some long-term consequences to that, too. But it, it, is, it does work. They've done research on it. It is effective. Yeah. Oh, so it does the sugar. Is it the sugar? The sugar is causing an adrenaline release, and your brain will focus more if adrenaline is being released. For instance, there was an experiment that was done where they, of course, had college students for extra credit probably come in, and they showed them pictures. It was a bunch of pictures, and some of them were really not boring, but you know, just nice, whatever bland pictures, like a landscape, a flower, a sunset, and then there was a picture of like a dead soldier, and things like that, and I mean, really like graphic definitely would get your like attention sort of thing. And then they had the students come in a month later and write down all the pictures that they remember. Now, would you remember the picture of a, a dead soldier? Sure. Mm -hmm. Of course. They all remembered it. But then they did the experiments again, and they gave the students an adrenaline blocker so that when they looked at that picture, the adrenaline did not shoot up. Did they remember it when they no. came back? No. Significantly less remember that picture. Because the brain did not say it was important. So the brain, it was there, it went into sensory memory, maybe even went into short-term memory, but the brain never shuttled it to long-term memory either to say that this was important. At every staff meeting, after a long day, and I need to go to them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's oh, candy in the middle of the table. Yeah. Because they know they're going to be putting stuff up there that... Mm -hmm. could care they want you to stay awake yes. and then also pay attention candy to candy on the table all the time. Yeah. That's why yeah. we've all gained so much. Yeah. Because <laughs> it works. The truth is it works. That's why we self-medicate with sugar, because it is an effective drug. And sugar is definitely a drug. Um, it's as addictive as cocaine, which is crazy. But try stopping sugar. I know. I've tried. It doesn't last more than a hard. Day. Yeah. Not more than a day. Yeah. And then you get into withdrawals and you get obsessed with it, just like a Coke addict would do. Yeah. Um, they've actually done experiments with rats. There was a classic cocaine experiment where they offered, um, there's like two bridges going out of the cage, and one goes to food, the other goes to cocaine. And after they get the rat addicted to cocaine, they now electrify the bridge that goes to cocaine. The one to food, not electrified. And they will ignore the food, and they will continue to go up over the bridge to cocaine, even though it's shocking them. And they will continue to increase the uh, voltage of it until it kills the rat. Mm -hmm. And the rat will kill itself trying to get to the cocaine. Wow. Mm -hmm. Then they did the same experiment with sugar. Guess what the rat did? Same thing. Same thing. Killed itself to get to the sugar. Oh, no. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, sugar is super addictive. I always hate, because, you know, I, I'm in photography. So I always hate how photographers will do the... Um, well, not just photographers, always, obviously the parents too, but they'll do the first cake smash pictures. And I just think it's just so wrong. I mean, everybody thinks it's cute and adorable, and that's the that's like, thing. Why don't you do the first cocaine snort pictures with your kids too? You know, it's, it's the same drug, and we're getting our kids addicted to sugar, and we all think it's adorable. So that, I think that's why sugar is an extra dangerous drug, because it's just so accepted. As a matter of fact, if you're one of those parents that don't allow your kids to have sugar, everybody else is kind of like, you're a mean parent, right? Uh, yeah, we don't, don't want to sell it. It's probably a drug. Nothing. We don't do that. It is a drug, yeah. yeah I'm addicted yeah. to it, too. I'm not denying that. I've got a problem, too. If there's a sugar rehab center, I totally... I mean, I, I eat keto, so I try really hard to not eat sugar, but it's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, and then it's so accepted, too. It's just like cigarettes are really hard to get off of because it's not illegal. 
You can smoke cigarettes if you want. It's, a, it's easier to get off of heroin than cigarettes because you don't, you know, you're not, you don't walk out of rehab and somebody's shooting up right outside, well, I know, maybe a rehab center, there would be someone shooting up outside the door, but generally speaking, you know, you don't come across that every day. Um, and then they sneak sugar into everything to try to get your hands yeah, on and that's the thing, you really are eating it and all the things that you buy, your you know, right. bread, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's everywhere. Right. Oh, yeah, and, and those, I've actually, um, because I work, like, we have the wedding venue and stuff. I get these emails from like company development and how to do this such and such with your business. And I once got invited to a um, it's like a conference of how to addict your client. That was what the conference was called, how to addict your client. And it talked about how to cause dopamine release with the packaging of your products. Um, when if you're, they had a section for restaurants and food industry. And, how to cause your food, how to make your food cause a dopamine release. And, you know, dopamine Sounds illegal. illegal. It, I mean, it isn't. It's to totally legal. People like that. Yeah, it's totally legal. And it's effective, obviously. It's the same thing the drugs are doing to you, causing a dopamine release. Other neurotransmitters, too. That's one of the things. All right, so anyhow, <laughs> um, so you will remember this information, most likely, because it causes an emotional reaction for you. Okay? If you are bored with this conversation, you may not remember. It may not even have gotten into your short-term memory because um, you could be half asleep. So usually that's towards the end of the class. But. All right, so if it's important, if we focus on it, it will shuttle into short-term memory. And then we have a similar filter with long-term memory. Is it, okay, it's, maybe it's important enough to focus on right now. You know, like if you're walking down the street and somebody gives you a dirty look, yes, your brain goes, oh, dirty look, that could be dangerous, pay attention to it. But is that really important enough to save for the rest of your life in long-term memory? You know, if the person doesn't do anything, doesn't follow up the look, you may totally forget it. I mean, how many people have you walked past and you know you could re remember them, you could describe them, you know, a minute later, but can you describe them a year later? Probably not. You know, 99% of those people were not stored in our long-term memory. Okay. So... Um, the duration for, or the capacity for short-term memory is seven to nine items at any one time. Mm -hmm. It is very small. So how are you supposed to remember for tests then? <laughs> it's, just, it, it's difficult, huh? Well, the good thing is long-term memory can go back into short-term memory. So if you store something long-term, you can access it. You just have to be able to access it. That's if the tricky part. If you something short-term. If you store something short-term, the duration is only about 30 seconds top. I mean, think about somebody, I know we don't do this anymore because we just text our phone numbers, but back in the day, somebody would give you their phone number and you had to go write it down or, or put it in your phone. What do you do? Use your hand to write it. If you're smart, you use your hand to write it down, yes, because we know we're not going to remember it. But what would we do if we couldn't write it down? Same, same. You say it over and over again. This is what we call rehearsal. Because rehearsal reactivates this duration. And so you may be able to keep it, your short-term memory, long enough to get it, to either get it memorized or to get it written down. But we know we're not going to keep hold of that information very long. So for a test, how do you get, because you've got a lot more than seven or nine things to remember, how do you store like 150 things? And well, the important thing is that to be able to activate the memory stores in long term so that it can be pulled into short term. So, um, so you've got this cluster of memory stores, right? Mm -hmm. And some of them are connected, you know, sort of like that. So you need to, let's say this is the information you need to get to right here. Okay. You can all of these things that are connected, if you activate any one point, it will eventually get to the one that you want. Because they're all electrical wiring. So it's just like if you stick your finger in the electric socket, all of a sudden you become part of the electrical wiring. So anything that's connected can activate what you're getting towards. And that's why you try to think. Like if you're trying to remember something, you try to think around the idea. And you're, what you're trying to do is stimulate some neuron that's connected to the idea you're trying to get to. So when you're studying, you're storing the information and you're storing concepts that are associated with it. So that's one of the reasons why I say practice with quizzes because somebody will say um, to you, okay, tell me what short-term memory is. So now the word short-term memory 
is associated with the definition. And now when you see the word short-term memory on the exam, the definition gets activated in your mind. So that's what studying is doing. Studying is strengthening these connections. Every time you study something, it makes a connection, makes a connection again, and starts strengthening the connection between the two neurons. So every, it's sort of like a, a path. You know, if you walk through a field in the desert for the first time, it's going to be difficult. You're walking over bushes and you're getting cactus in your ankles or whatever. If you walk through it enough times, it turns into a path. You keep walking down it, it'll widen. Eventually, somebody's going to turn it into a road and, you know, and then it becomes a freeway. That's the same thing with the neurons. And the better the path is, the faster you can travel down it. So you can remember the information like that. So when you like, explain it back to somebody, that's a good way? To yes. Get it. Teaching is the most effective way of creating this bond. So when you're working together in a study group and you're quizzing each other, when the person gets it wrong, you have the information in front of you and you say, no, short term is blah, 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 to help them. And now you have just solidified it very well in your neurons, in your long-term memory. And you also said talking to yourself while you're... Talking to yourself, too, yeah. If you can't work with somebody else, then working with yourself in the same way. Like, for instance, um, I would occasionally, I would do, like, PowerPoint, or you could do flashcards where you have the question on one side, and then on the other side is the answer. So you quiz yourself, and then you're sort of teaching yourself. I don't think it's quite as effective as working with somebody else, but it is definitely effective. And the other thing is when you get it wrong, you have a little bit of an adrenaline rush. And so you're, then your brain focuses more on the answer and is more likely to store it. So that's why that's also important. If you just reread the book over and over again, you're bored out of your mind and your brain says, this is not important enough to, to, to store. So you need to do something that's going to get your brain to say, this is important. So eating sugar and quizzing each other is <laughs> the best way to do it. So. I'm not a pro-sugar person, but it is effective. I know. And when I was in college, sometimes you just have to do it. Um, so, yeah. You could also hook yourself up to, like, an electroshock system, and if you get it wrong, <laughs> then your brain would really store the information. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. All right. Um, Can I get one? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one example of that we have this limited capacity is if you have, like, um, okay, can you remember this number? After a while. Okay, can you remember it now? Uh, mm -mm. But if you break it down into three, now all of a sudden, that's a lot easier to remember, right? It's just 951 342 7819. Now that's we remember three. Phone numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is how we remember phone numbers or social security numbers or something like that. Is that we break it down into units and our mind says that's one unit of the seven to nine that we can hold on to. Okay. Uh, and the same thing happens with studying. Notice your book is chunked into chapters and headings and subheadings. And so instead of those all being individual information, those are chunks of information and your brain can hold on to that information better. So that's why I always say try to understand the concept before you start memorizing all the details. What is the point of this chapter? What is the point of this section? And now try to attach all the details to it. And that's these neurons too, right? You have the concept, and then you can start attaching all of the details onto it. Okay, so that then when the concept is brought up in an exam, it activates all the details. Instead, what people do is they just memorize everything individually and make no connections. So unless this exact thing is brought up, your memory stores can't send you the information. But if they're all connected because you understand the concept, then any of these things could activate that bit of information that you're looking for. So that's why you need to make connections. What is the importance of this? Why am I learning this percentage for some research paper that was done in relation to the idea of short-term memory. You know, why, why was my teacher talking about rats and cocaine experiments in relationship to memory? Okay, right, that's a whole chain of connections that have been made. Um, but if you've made that chain of connections, then your brain will activate it for you. But if you just remember everything individually, now you have to have that exact information and you have to be on top of the 
you know, you really have to know the stuff in order for it to get activated. And nobody's that good. So you have to connect everything to the concept. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I should teach this chapter first, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so long-term memory, the capacity um, is also believed to be potentially limitless, and the duration could be hours to years. Your long-term memory holds on to information as long as it thinks it's important. So, for instance, walking across campus and you see somebody walk past you the other way, that obviously goes into your sensory memory, possibly your short-term memory if something drew your attention to it, and then, especially if a person gave you a bad look, you're probably going to remember that for the rest of the day. Now, by tomorrow or a month from now, your long-term memory will probably have dumped it. Like, there's no point. Nothing happened. There's no point in remembering this. So if you really want to understand memory, watch that movie Inside Out, the cartoon. It is oh, yeah. excellent in, like, how memories are handled. It's actually pretty accurate. Um, so it goes through anything that's unimportant, we, we chuck it. So which of course is why it's so important to convince your brain that what you're studying is important, whether you hate it or not. That was the hypothalamus, right, that they were all in? I think so, yeah. Right. It would make sense. Uh -huh. The yeah. control yes. center yeah. of your brain. Yeah, That's what has to be shot in zombies. Mm -hmm. Alright, turn them off. Um, okay, so, and the limitless part, let me show you a good video. Interesting, huh? Know where you get these videos. Fantastic. Uh, how can she, can she remember things that she hasn't, like she was just flipping through a book. So no, it would have to know be something it. she was exposed to. Yeah. Well, then how does she know she, she well, read the whole book? You, she was looking up like Diane um, Sawyer. Oscar nomination, Oscar winnings and things like that. I'm not sure what book she was using, but I mean, she, the, the woman grew up in Hollywood, so uh -huh. she okay. would have been exposed yeah. to some of the things like that. I know yeah. she does her. Right? Although you'd be surprised. I did have a student once who had, I think it was a photographic memory, so she, she didn't remember everything, but she remembered everything she saw. And she got a C in my Psych 101 class, and I said to her, how in the world could you have ended up with a C? This should have been a breeze. And she said, well, no offense, but I don't really like psychology, and I didn't want to remember this for the rest of my life. So she just didn't study. Wow. Yeah, she said just enough to pass, and that was it. Right? Okay, well. My feelings are hurt, but okay. <laughs> She's actually a still good friend of mine, but it's amazing that she can do that. So, um, yeah. And it is very interesting that that level of memory is also associated with OCD and hoarding and, and such. My oldest sister is actually very similar to that. She doesn't remember everything as well as her, but I swear she remembers. She remembers so much. She's like, no, that is not what happened to us when we were three years old. It was blah, blah, blah. And my mom's like, yeah, that, that's what happened when you were three. And it's amazing. And she has the same issue. She has a really hard time letting go of things emotionally and physically. Um, I remember she lived at my place for a while, and she left a bunch of her junk there because, of course, your family is your storage facility. And so I told her, you don't get it. I'm going to go through your stuff and, and toss out the trash. And, and of course, she didn't because she's the oldest sister, so she thinks I won't actually follow up on my friend. So I'm going through stuff, and I'm sending her pictures. I'm throwing this away, and this, and she's flipping out. I had to finally stop and say, okay, fine, I'll wait for you to get here, but we have to, we have to clean this mess up. But it was like a receipt from Taco Bell from 1989. Don't throw that away. Why? Why are you going, you, that, there's no value to that whatsoever. Well, I remember why, what happened when we got that receipt. Wow. I, <laughs> I'll look through a receipt from like a week ago and go, where, where did I go to this place? I don't even remember that. So she stole all of the memory in the family and like the rest of us have no memory. So it's, it's a weird, weird thing. Yeah, I couldn't understand the high school notes. Yeah. Like, yeah why I would you, even though you have a great memory, why would you want to keep that? Yeah. You remember it, so mm -hmm. why not throw it away? Yeah. It may not necessarily be because there's positive emotions associated with it. It may just be that whatever is triggering the brain to hold on to memories also triggers you to want to hold on to physical things. It, it may be the same. I mean, you've got brain hoarding as well as physical hoarding. So, but what the cause of that is exactly, we don't know. So 
it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, weird, huh? But it is it is possible to remember everything. Now, how you get that superpower, I, I don't know. And do you want that superpower? Is that the same kind of memory? So um, this, some of this beginning stuff is review, so we'll go through it sort of fast. Memory, right now we have a very information processing type of approach to understanding memory, like a computer and its memory system. You type in information and it saves it. Uh, we do have different areas of memory. Um, I'm not a supercomputer geek, but we have like the actual memory on the hard drive and then you have RAM memory, I think, and that's like short term and long term. So your, your computer can save what is active on the screen currently, but then it can also save more information more deeply. And then that information has to be retrieved and put up on the screen. So it's just like how our brain works. So once the computer metaphor, when computers were invented and we got this metaphor for how our mind works, it really helped to advance the idea of um, our own mind and how it was processing information and paying attention to things, perceiving things, remembering them, and so on. Okay. What does amid mean? Amid what? Amid. Amid, yeah. Um, amid means like amongst, in, in with other things. So... I could throw something amid all the students. Expanding your vocabulary. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the approach emerged amid or amongst the evidence um, that the behaviorist approach could not account for performance on all learning and memory tasks. So behaviorism tried to explain how we remember things and how we um, learn and so on, but it, it was not a perfect explanation for it. So like behaviorists tried to say, we remember things because of classical conditioning or operant conditioning. Well, not everything is explained that way. That's a very simplistic approach to how we learn. It is true, but it certainly does not cover all areas of learning and memory. And behaviorists, behaviorists have always been and are arrogant. I've never met a behaviorist that didn't think that he was the best psychologist out there and amongst the best field of psychology and everybody else is just kind of stupid, so, but it's not the case. You know what's so funny that, that's how my mom is, and the other day I had to teach him how to print, mm -hmm. paper front and back, yeah. yeah, but you know everything. Well, you know, the more people feel inferior, the, the more superior they tend to act to compensate for it, so, sort of like bullies. Mm -hmm. Bullies are always the people with the worst self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yes, I'm going to skip through some of this. This is just about the different memory stores. We already talked about that. Um, now, these are some terms for processes that happen in the memory systems. So we have to encode information. This is when it comes in through sensory input, and it has to be turned into something electrical for our brain to recognize because our brain works on electricity. So that's really amazing. For instance, um, if you look at the ear canal, and you'll learn more about this in physiology. I'm not a physiologist. I'm the daughter of a physiologist, so I have to learn some of this stuff. So for instance, in the ear canal, um, you know, you've got the, the ear, and the information comes in, and it goes through all the tympanic membrane. And it hits the tym when sound waves come in, it hits the tympanic membrane, it changes the sound waves to something else, goes through all the little labyrinthine system, and eventually it gets to, you know, the cochlea, which sort of looks like a snail, and if you blow that up, inside of that tunnel, there are these cells with little hairs on them, and the sound waves knock the hairs over, and there is an electric uh, generator in each of those cells that, as the hairs move, triggers the generator to produce electricity, which then enters into the, the auditory nerve so that your brain can recognize sound in an electric signal. It is a genius, amazing mechanism for connecting the physical world to the electric world of your brain. So that is what encoding is. It's the process of turning information into something physical so that your brain can recognize it. It's crazy. brain is full of little generators, probably Honda. Well, some of you are Honda generators, and others are like, I don't know, Decker. They're gone, they're gone. 
Yes, and when they're gone, they're gone. So if you overstimulate these hairs, you can break them, and now you become deaf if you go to too many rock concerts. It's the process of turning. Encoding is a process of turning something into an electric signal that the brain can recognize. Turning sound waves, light waves, so on, into an electrical signal. Because your brain is electric. Your body is electric. Which is why it's really bad to be struck by lightning. Consolidation is when you take the information and you store it into long-term memory. You consolidate it, you, you tighten it up and put it into a nice little package and put it into your long-term storage facility. You consolidate it. Now, consolidation can take a while. Um, and you can help it out by getting enough sleep, which is why your professors always tell you, don't stay up all night the night before an exam cramming, because you actually don't remember it as well. One experiment, they took college students, and they had them work on math problems. And they gave some students, I think they started the project at 4 o'clock, and one group of students, they said, stay up all night working on these math problems. The other ones got, I think, four hours, and then they were sent home and told to get a, a night's rest. And when they came back in the next morning, the other group still working on their math problems, and then they were given another, I think, two hours to work on the math problems. Who solved more math problems correctly? The ones who got the rest. The ones who got the rest. Okay? Because for some reason, while they were sleeping, their brain continued to work on the problems, continued to make neural connections in order to enhance and make their brain more efficient with these math problems. Um, never mind. Okay. Okay. Which is also one reason why kids growing up in poverty do so much worse in school because I mean, my dad is a cop so and I've gone on ride-alongs with him and you go into a ghetto house somewhere in downtown San Bernardino at 3 o'clock in the morning and what are those children doing? They're up all night trying to They're up the all they night. Yep. They're up all night watching TV, drinking coffee, doing something. They are not asleep. I don't know when those kids sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they are so sleep deprived. Mom and dad are cracked out in the back bedroom. They're awake watching TV. Which is, you know, one of my biggest issues as far as putting the test scores on the teachers. These kids are up all night. You can ask them, what time did you go to bed? I went to bed at 3. Yeah. 3? Yeah. You know, I texted you. Yeah, I texted you at 2.30. What do you mean you texted them? At? I mean, yeah. it's just, they're I mean, not sleeping. They're not sleeping. Yeah. And they're coming and they're, they're doing this in class. And who lays down in class? Mm -hmm. But these kids are now yeah. sleeping. They're, they're not sleeping. They have a horribly stressful home life. They eat terrible food because mom and dad are, they're not, their brain is not working to cook. Um, and so they're like, here's a box of Ritz crackers, knock yourself out. Ritz crackers. You know, it's the, the cheapest, uh, most processed food is like that's it. the easy stuff. Buy your kids some bagel bites and, you know, and they'll be happy too because bagel bites are awesome. Um, but there's not a lot of nutrition in it. So how is the brain supposed to develop appropriately? Right? So, yeah. You sleep better, you consolidate information better. Now, consolidation could take years, potentially. Consolidation is not an instantaneous process. Consolidation is a long-term thing. Could take hours, could take months, could take years for this information to be solidly stored in your brain, which is why, even though some things are stored long-term, sometimes you forget them anyways, because consolidation could get messed up, could get disrupted. Um, certain medications disrupt consolidation. If you take a beta blocker to slow your heart rate down or to decrease your blood pressure or to treat anxiety, that blocks consolidation. Electroconvulsive mm -hmm. shock therapy blocks consolidation. Probably most of you are not getting that. Um, but we still do use it today. It's used as an, an extreme measure for depression. So if you have depression that won't respond to any treatments and you commit, try to commit suicide multiple times, then you may be offered electroconvulsive shock therapy because for some reason it works as like a reset button for the brain. And a lot of people's depression is significantly uh, reduced after going through electroconvulsive shock therapy. Is that painful? It, it is a horribly painful process. Um, let me show you an old video. Wait, can I ask, because I've heard they did it. To kids like under 18, they did yes. that like 20 years ago. Yes. Why, why would they have done yeah. that? Um, because it calms people down. So if you were a bad patient, then um, then I'd give this to you and it would calm you down. 
trying to find. There's it's an old black and white. Yeah, I can't believe they seem like they would scramble. I don't think this is it, but I'm sure it'll work. Was working on an alternative form of convulsive therapy. His theory was based on a somewhat slipshod anecdotal observation that epileptic patients rarely, if ever, suffered from schizophrenia. In the belief that it was the fits that produced the beneficial effect, he tried to induce them artificially. He achieved this by injecting the convulsant chemical metrazole. And although the original theory had no real foundation, there were enough favorable results to encourage its widespread use. Okay, so you get the idea. So we shock you with something. Also, they started giving convulsant medications. And between the two, you have a tremendous um, convulsion. The electricity causes it itself, and then they also started to enhance oh, so it. That, well, I thought it was something to put them to sleep while they did the procedure. No, but this is the procedure has been done. This is the effect of the procedure. But, okay, yeah. I'm not getting it. Why aren't they doing it to, why are they giving something to put in the seizure? I don't know. Um, because the doctor believed that the benefit of the, electric, of the electrocution was the convulsion that the electrocution caused. But the benefit was actually the electricity. So he tried to enhance the convulsions. But the being shocked with electricity like that through your brain is going to cause a seizure no matter what. They just ended up trying to make it even worse. So we don't know what, what the results were with this person, do we? Not with, well, probably not with that person exactly, but we do know the results in general. It calmed the person down, decreased depression, decreased psychotic episodes. Um, and we're doing it to a rabbit there too. So I'm traumatizing you guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got a girl with um, you, but no, it's a bunny. Um, so, oh, yeah. we'll, we'll remember this. Yes, <laughs> right there, you got your adrenaline up. Um, so, uh, so it had those benefits, the depression, calming them down, and so on. Uh, the problem back then was also the convulsions could be so bad, it could snap limbs, it could snap your spine, bite, bite your tongue off, things like that. I mean, it was, it could be really bad. That's super why painful. Guard, right? That's why they do the mouth guard, yeah, because they had a few tongues bit off and they learned, or teeth cracked, because oh. you're clenching down so hard. Um, nowadays, when they do electroconvulsive shock therapy, obviously they do not, not try to enhance the convulsion, so that's safer. And then they also give muscle relaxant so that you don't go into a whole body convulsion. So, I mean, technically your brain is having a seizure, but your body does not do that. I mean, that's the really painful part. Um, and it works. It's really effective. Now, the downside of it is that it blocks consolidation. So people usually lose their past memories for an entire month, maybe more, sometimes a few months. And they could lose memories for the next few months as well. It could block future consolidation from occurring. So you could, in theory, you could lose almost a year of your life if you get electroconvulsive shock therapy. And so that's why it is like a last-ditch effort for treating depression. But it is effective. So, I mean, if it's, I lose some months of my life, or I'm going to end up killing myself, you're probably going to choose to lose some of your memory. And the shocking itself, the electrocution does not kill anybody anymore like it used to, because we don't believe that the convulsion is helpful. We try to stop that from happening. Weird. Um, what they're doing now with the flu shots, they're putting the flu in you, so that way you can become more Yeah, that's how all vaccines work put the actual virus into somebody dead, hopefully, inactive, and then um, they build up, their immune system is able to see it and build up a immunity to it. But you can still catch it. There's a possibility. The flu itself um, mutates so fast, I, I don't think there's any benefit to a flu vaccine. I don't know. I don't like shots. They say every 10 years, but it's more like every two. Well, sometimes it's every season. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. Last season, they said the flu mutated like four times in one season. Wow. So if you got the first shot, then sure, you were protected from that flu, but not for the next three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, storage, we talked about that. So storage is the holding of memory, and then retrieval is getting the information back. Because remember, you can only be consciously aware of what's in short-term memory. So once it's stored in long-term memory, you have to pull it out. Just like a storage facility, you can't use your furniture if it's in the storage. You have to take it out in order to use it. Um, and of course, we talked about that there are some 
tricks to being able to retrieve the memory easier. We also have, um, I mean, we come up with lots of shortcuts on how to, how to retrieve memory. Like the um, orangutans always play with little gorillas, you know, that mnemonic for Freud's psychosexual stages. So we come up, we have these little ways of trying to trigger neurons to release information. What is that acronym? Orangutans always play with little gorillas, oral, anal, phallic, latency, genital. All right, so those are the basic functions of the memory system. Uh, let's see, we talked about that. We also have implicit and explicit memory stores, which is an important distinction. So this is long-term memory, and we know physiologically, and if you look at the anatomy of the brain, our long-term memory has two separate sections, one for explicit and one for implicit memory. Implicit memories are memories that we've learned but we don't remember learning. Explicit, we can remember the origins of it. So if I asked you where did you learn about explicit and implicit memories, you'd say, oh, that was my Psych 110 class. If I asked you where you learned to walk, chances are you do not remember that occurring, unless you had to relearn how to walk because of an accident or something. Anybody ever had to do that? I, I have an explicit memory of being able to use my left hand because I broke my arm and I had to go through physical therapy. Um, so most people, that would be an implicit memory. Um, so, implicit memories can start explicit, so as a child you had a memory of learning to walk, but eventually that got shifted into implicit memory and you lost the initial memory of it. Um, learning how to ride a bike, that is initially explicit, and you may have some <coughs> memories of it, but it's become so natural and automatic to you that you don't have to think it through anymore. There doesn't have to be any conscious thought for you to act on that. And so that's when a memory has been shifted over to implicit memory. Yeah. With me, um, I was never taught to have a time when she was going to write a bike. I just knew how to do it one by one. Okay. So you still learn, but you're very good at observational learning. So most people have to be taught that. So that's really good. Your mom said that? Um, no, I, 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 I taught my sister that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you, you're talented at observational learning. Okay, I think that's pretty much it for implicit and explicit. Um, so just remember that there are some things, this is sort of like Freud's idea of the unconscious, the implicit memory. There's things that are working in our mind that we're acting on, but we don't remember having knowledge of it. It's just there. And so this could be the same for your emotions and psychology and, and everything as well. Now, children do not store things well in explicit memory, babies, like toddler age. So up until four or five years old, the explicit memory center is not fully functional. So this is why we have what's called infantile amnesia. We forget our childhood. Probably very few of you can remember anything before five years old. Now my oldest sister can, but <laughs> most people cannot. So, so when they say, like, for this first few years or the formative years, mm -hmm. where is that stored that kids can That's stored remember? in the implicit memory. So everything they experience during that age is being stored in their brain. That's one thing that we have to remember. So we think, oh, they're not going to remember any of this, so it won't affect them. Yes, it will. Um, for instance, if you have surgery and you're put under anesthesia, that's very dangerous. Even localized anesthesia can be dangerous, especially if you're a baby. So for many years, we believed it was better for babies to experience the pain of a procedure than to have the danger of anesthesia. But now we know that that painful event is stored in their brain, it changes their neurological wiring, and it actually leads to chronic pain in the future. Oh. Mm -hmm. So even though they don't remember the event, it's still in their brain, and it's affecting them dramatically. So now we give babies anesthesia. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? So because um, I used to dance when I basically started walking, mm -hmm. um, because I kept on going I can remember that before I was five, and that line it was always, I look forward to seeing steps later on. Probably, yeah. So your older memories are associated with the baby memories, too. Yeah. It's probably at least part of it. And you may be one of the people who has better memories than other people as well. So it's always possible. Some people can remember. There's some people who claim they can be, remember being born, which most scientists say is not possible, but who knows? Freud would say no. Freud would probably say no. But Freud would still believe it was affecting you. Freud was big on 
childhood trauma. And, and research in psychology does show that even trauma being born can affect you. Because that, that stress and everything is still written in your brain neurology. So just because a child doesn't remember something does not mean that it's not affecting them. Um, you know, the, the idiot parents that brought their two-year-old to Jurassic World the other day, uh, when I went to see it, they're going to think, oh, my child will never remember this. Well, it's still written in their brain chemistry, still written in their neurons. That baby watched the whole movie, saw people being torn apart by dinosaurs. So that could be a good stress, um, uh, the birthing process for the child, because the that's the whole, what you were saying about some stress is good and prepares you for... Yes, I would say in general, a normal birth is a, a acceptable stress for a baby. Um, as a matter of fact, a C-section is considered more stressful, it's harder on a baby. More babies are going to die with C-sections than natural births. Um, of course, there's also more risk factors generally in C-sections. But, but I'm, I'm talking about a traumatized birth. So like the cord is wrapped around you, the baby's breached, something like that. Um, the mom is really stressed out. So like some hospitals used to, and still some hospitals do, like strap mom down and don't allow her to move, whether she wants to or not. Um, that used to be a very common practice. Uh, and so that can be, if the mom's going through that much trauma, the baby's also going through that much trauma. So that could affect their ability to handle their emotions long term. Would, would you say it's better to, to um, have a natural birth at home with the midwife? Yes, I would say assuming you're perfectly healthy and nothing goes wrong, then yes, that would be the ideal situation because it's the least stressful. Um, now, I would not do it unless I was close to a good hospital, yeah. which means I would not do it up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, if you wanted to rent a nice house next to Loma Linda University and do that, sure, go for it. I think that would be great. Um, but, yeah, I would, or maybe next to Cedar Sinai, then you'd be really smart. Right? Go to Beverly Hills and, and have your baby. But yeah, like in um, Scandinavia, Denmark, Netherlands, all those places, the home birth is just, that's what's expected. Almost everybody's born at home. Unless there is a significant risk factor. Like you already have preeclampsia or you've had a history of issues with your child. Preeclampsia is high blood pressure. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you're diabetic, gestational diabetes, or some risk factor, yeah. But generally speaking, yeah, I mean, the, least, the less stress, the better. And hospitals can be pretty stressful. All right, um, so in explicit memory, we also have found that there are two sections of that, so semantic and episodic. Semantic is like your crystallized intelligence. Um, it's the data, the knowledge that you have, the facts that you learn. And episodic are the stories you go through. So, um, and you see the, the proof of this difference in somebody with Alzheimer's. People with Alzheimer's don't remember the story of, of their lives, but they remember the information. They never forget information. They just may not be able to associate that information with uh, like a person's face or a story of their past. So one area can be damaged while the other is fine. Why do they say, um, I've heard on many reports that uh, people with Alzheimer's, they can forget everything. Mm -hmm. And the only thing they can remember is music. If they're a musician, they can Play it, because it's stored in a different part of the brain. Lyrics, but that's the mm -hmm. last thing to go. It's yeah. the musical part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the musical part of the brain is less sensitive to what's destroying the brain with Alzheimer's. Diabetes type 3 is what they're calling it now. Um, oh, really? Yeah. What they think is causing Alzheimer's, this is the current theory, is that the brain cells are becoming insulin resistant. They can't take in glucose anymore, and so they starve to death and start to die. Mm -hmm. Which is why Alzheimer's is on the rise, because we have such crappy lifestyles. Back to that sugar again. Yeah. Now, right. would they be able to fix that if they know that that's the issue? Yes, there is some evidence that you can. For instance, going onto a ketogenic diet where you're producing ketones from fat instead of glucose from sugar, because the brain cells can run off of the ketones. So even though your cells can't take in sugar, they can still take in fat and run off of fat. You have two energy sources you can use, fat and sugar. You can't use sugar, use fat. It's better for you anyways. So you can build your memory back? If the cells are dead, they're dead. But you have to destroy a lot of cells in your brain before you get obvious signs of Alzheimer's. So by the time you've got severe Alzheimer's, 
there's permanent damage that's been done. Now, that does not mean that you can't bring it back some, to some degree. You know, the person may be able to recognize a family member. For instance, I had a similar conversation with a student in a Psych 101 class a couple years back, and she, she put her mom, I think, had Alzheimer's. She put her on a ketogenic diet, tons of coconut oil and, and so on to produce ketones from fat, and she said her mom became functional again. She said she still had a really bad memory, but she was able to recognize family members and and, um, and they could leave her by herself without flipping out wow. about she, she might run away, like Alzheimer's people often do. She doesn't get lost anymore. So it was a significant improvement. And that was severe Alzheimer's. Like they had to have somebody with her 24 hours a day or she'd take off. She didn't recognize yeah. anybody. They take off. Yeah. I used yeah. to work in a couple of homes. Yeah, and they take off. Because yeah. they don't recognize their surroundings and it makes yeah. them scared. And so they go to try to find something they do recognize. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so if you look at long-term memory, you have explicit, and you have implicit. Under explicit memory, you have um, semantic and episodic, like TV episode, so it's a story. See, I just made a neur neuronal connection for you that will help you to remember that. And research has shown that these are physically different sections of the brain. So let's say you get in a car accident. You could destroy the episodic part of your brain. You don't remember any stories in your life. You can't remember any future stories. But you remember all the information associated with it. You could tell me the definition of semantic memory, but you can't remember for the life of you where you learned about it. Because okay? the information is still there, but you've destroyed this section of the brain. Interesting, huh? All right, um, that's probably it, mostly it, and yeah, you can read that on your own. All right, so let's talk about development of memory. So the infant, the infant obviously does not have great memory stores. The explicit memory is not functioning very well. You may have noticed on the last slide, which I skipped over this point, as you age, the explicit memory store grows in capacity and gets more efficient. So an infant does not have it has hardly any explicit memory available. Um, so, of course, we have done all sorts of experiments on babies to see how well their memory works. One thing that we found is they have the ability to imitate, which if you've been around babies, you know this, they love imitating. But imitation means they remember what you just did. So babies do have memory occurring, and they can remember, um, remember what they just saw. So, They'll stick out their tongues when you stick out your tongue. Um, and the interesting thing is that they will be able to continue to do it. So it's not just short-term memory. We know their long-term memory is also developed as well. Even 24 hours later, <coughs> they'll still be doing the same thing that you were doing. Right? So that imitation proves their, um, their long-term memory is stored. Now, we usually see that what we call deferred <coughs> imitation, where they're doing it the next day, uh, around six months old. So possibly their long-term memory is not intact or not super intact until around six months. Which is also when we really see um, the baby developing as a unique person. They start to really, you really start to see a personality in the baby around six months. And that's because they're starting to store their experiences much more efficiently. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. We also look at habituation. This is another factor of memory that helps us to research whether babies can remember things. And habituation is just boring. How quickly do you get used to something? Now, if you never remember something, it's always new. I have a terrible memory. I can reread a book that I read like 10 years ago. Totally new book. I don't remember it at all. It's great having a bad memory. <laughs> you never hold grudges. You never upset. Or sometimes you're like, I'm vaguely upset at this person, but I don't remember why. Because I just need to let it go. I don't know. Um, That's awesome. Sometimes it's hard as like a teacher, though, especially when I'm teaching multiple classes. I'll have to ask, what did we go over last time? I have no idea where we stopped. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it has its pros and cons. But habituation is. If you remember something, eventually you get bored out of it. How, how many times can you watch a movie before you're like, I don't want to watch this again? Once. Once. Okay? So your habituation with movies is one time. 
I'm pretty much like that. It depends. I like it depends on the content. If it's something hilarious, yeah. I, uh, I want to see it again and yeah, laugh again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that all depends on memory, right? You're remembering what the movie was like previously. So we can show a baby a toy, or we can show them a video, or there's all sorts of experiments that have been done to track how quickly does a baby get bored of something. How quickly do they toss a toy away and not want to play with it anymore? And we've also seen that the smarter a child's future intelligence, the faster they habituate, which is an interesting connection between intelligence and memory. Yeah. Um, or if you want to like show someone something, you know, then you're willing to rewatch it or save it for them instead of throwing it away right there. Right, which also involves memory because you're remembering how good it is. So um, habituation is learning to not respond to a stimulus such as the dripping of the leaky faucets. Although, I don't know about you, but I never habituate to that. That is really annoying. The sound of traffic going by. How many of you notice the sound of traffic? A few of you. Okay, so some of you aren't habituated. I'm not because I live out in the middle of nowhere. So when a, I hear the sound of a car, that really sticks out. Okay, so my, I've actually become unhabituated. But I grew up in the city, and cars went by all the time, and you learned to ignore it. Or the smell of something, like somebody's perfume you eventually get used to it. You're still smelling it, but your brain just shuts off any reaction to it. And some people are soothed by it. They need to hear it, right? They need to hear the stimulation. Yes. Like the traffic because, when you're sleeping. Right, because habituation basically means boredom. Boredom is relaxing and calming and puts you to sleep. So if it's something that you, you may not be habituated to silence. And if you're not habituated to something, then your brain is paying attention to it. Your brain might maybe trickling out a little bit of adrenaline, and that's going to keep you awake. Because your brain's like, why is it silent? What's wrong? What's going on? And that's not the type of mindset you want if you're trying to get to sleep. Um, so, let's see, question? Yeah. That's what happens when people drive the same route every day, right? Yes, you become habituated to it. Your brain doesn't think it's important. And at some point, your brain may not store that trip in long-term memory. So you get to the end of it, and you're like, I don't even remember getting here. It's not that you weren't aware of everything going on and making decisions and conscious, but your brain didn't put that story, that episode, into your long-term memory. My mom was always like, you know what, you need to make noise around the baby. The baby needs noise, because if the baby doesn't yeah. have noise, and it's, you know, always be and you'll always have to yeah. be quiet when that person's sleeping, that person will never be able to sleep through noise. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I never understood that. Like, yeah. Why would we that's make the noise if the baby's sleeping? Right. And so, of course, this is all proving that babies do have memory because they do habituate to things. They get used to things. They're capable of recognition memory, so they recognize things they've seen before. Um, there may be some things that they prefer over something else. There's people they prefer over others. Um, babies don't react to mom's face right away, but they do pretty quickly, and they recognize mom over other people. Um, dad comes second, assuming yeah. that both parents are there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Um, but now, of course, that's it's not that mom is just naturally better for baby. If it's a single parent and it's a dad raising the baby, then dad will be the first person they recognize. It's just mom spends more time around newborns than dad does. She also say newborns already recognize the voice, right? The yes, newborns will recognize the voice as soon as they're born because they have memory even in the uterus in utero of mom's voice. Yeah. And anybody else who is around often, so it could be dad too. Okay. <laughs> <they're important> too. <laughs> okay, so yeah, even even uh, pre-born babies have memory. Now, obviously, it's not fully developed memory, but it is still there. Um, other experiments that have been done, like with um, conditioning, offering conditioning, of course, requires memory because you have to remember there was a reward or a consequence for your behavior. So you're associating your own behavior with some effect. Um, and babies will very quickly learn. They did this great experiment where they tied a mobile. So you know the things that hang down with all the cute little toys on it. They tied that to the baby's ankle so the baby could make it move on their own by kicking their leg. And babies learned very quickly that they could control the mobile, which of course is more evidence that they have memory. They can remember things. Um, and then also, Two to four weeks later, infants were shown mobile again, and they kicked vigorously to try to make it move. So they remembered, even a month later, that they had the ability to control this mobile, even though they hadn't even been tied to it yet. They were trying to 
to make it move. This also demonstrates that memories are cue dependent. So we've talked about cues like um, the, a word short-term memory that cues the definition in your neurons. So those neurons are connecting, and even infants are able to, when one neuron's activated, to activate the next one. So seeing a mobile activated the concept of I can kick to make it move. So they're, they're cue dependent as well as context specific memories. They were not just kicking all the time. They only kicked when they saw the mobile there. Okay, and these are advanced types of memories. So the brain is pretty well developed even as soon as the baby is born. So remember this when you are misbehaving in front of an infant. Okay. They may not remember learning it, but they learn it. Um we talked about. This already. So as young as six months, babies can imitate novel behaviors even after a 24-hour period. Okay, so six months old, they have that um, deferred imitation. By age two, events can be recalled for months, and they the recall is less cue dependent. So they can just remember it in general. They don't have to be cued to remember it. Okay, which is where you want your memory of study material to get. You don't want to have to be cued to remember it. You want to just remember it in general. Um, and then the more they develop language, the more verbal they become, the better their memory is. So there's something about learning language that cues um, the development of your memory. And we know that if you learn multiple languages, your memory works even better. So two languages advances your memory systems tremendously. So it is always good. As you're learning it, or you have to already speak the language? Can you be learning languages? That's a really good question. I would say learning language at least provides some benefit to it. Um, by the time you're fluent, there's a huge effect. But I'd say the more you learn of it, the better your memory is going to get. Music also helps with this. Language and music are very connected in the brain. They're very similar systems. Um, so, yeah. uh, By age two, infants have become more verbal, can use words to reconstruct events that happened months earlier. So even a two-year-old can tell you about things that happened months before in their life. They can tell you about what happened when they were a year and a half, which is interesting. So even babies have been used, at, well not babies, but like toddlers have been used as witnesses in court cases. Um, what happened, what would happen to a, let's say, a four-year-old um, female toddler, let's say if the dad yells in her face and says, well, I don't love you, not my daughter, how would she take that in and how would she go to be? Well, it's going to hurt her feelings like it would hurt anybody else's feelings. Um, now, would she remember that when she was an adult? Four years old, that's borderline with an infantile amnesia. Some kids may remember that very explicitly, and other kids it's going to get stored in your implicit memory. I personally think it's even more dangerous to you if it's stored in your implicit memory because you have these feelings of inferiority, feeling unloved, maybe even anger towards your dad or towards men in general, um, but you don't remember why. And so it's hard to deal with it if it's something that's unconscious. So but yeah, it's still going to affect her, absolutely. And what about if she's taken away from that? Would she like lock that memory up? And it depends on what environment, hold on, it depends on what environment she's taken into. If she's taking it into a loving environment, then that's a protective factor that may erase all that past hurt. She's taken into the same bad environment or worse environment, obviously it's going to cause more problems. But ch especially children are very flexible, their brain's very plastic, so you can rewire many of those neurons to benefit the brain. Um, in the ACE study, that's what they're trying to especially the what study? The ACE study. Oh, the ACE study, I thought you said AIDS study. <laughs> that's what they found for infants, that, that's why they put them zero to 18 in the test, mm -hmm. because it, it actually still affects you later in life yes. if you don't have that parent that you can rely on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also have to remember that stress really what rewires the brain. No matter how old you are, stress is going to trigger many things in your brain, in your neurology, even your DNA. Stress completely affects your epigenetic system. So if you're stressed out, it may cause your epigenetics to change, now you get cancer. If you're stressed out, it may cause your epigenetics to change, now you get heart disease. Um, but it's also affecting the epigenetics of your neurons and how your neurons connect and disconnect. Um, cortisol is a very powerful hormone, which is being released in bucketfuls when you are stressed out. 
So it, even if it's a newborn baby and that baby is stressed out because mom and dad are screaming at each other, that's going to affect how the entire body, brain, and otherwise functions for the rest of their life. The stress hormones will rewire their brain. So babies should have nice, calm environments. Now, of course, like I said before, small doses of stress inoculate them. It's like a vaccine against future stress. So, but it has to be age appropriate. So can your 10-year-old handle you chewing them out for bad behavior? Yes, that's great for them. They need that. If they do something wrong, they need to be corrected. Can your six-month-old take the same level of being chewed out? No. You know, and they don't understand it, which is extra stressful. They, why are you angry at me? You're just supposed to be loving me and giving me a bottle of milk. So yelling at your six-month-old, or yeah, six-month-old is going to be way more stressful than the same level of yelling at your six-year-old or your 16-year-old. And yeah, they recognize faces, right? Like a happy face and yes. a mad face. Yes, and a mad face is very scary. Or a distant face, an emotional face is very scary. And they don't understand what's going on. So when your kid is 16 years old and you're just staring off into space without a smile on your face, they just go, oh, I guess mom's tired. They have an explanation for it, so it decreases the stress response to the same exact event. So that's why you have to remember stress needs to be age appropriate. Just like watching a movie like Jurassic World needs to be age appropriate because for younger kids it's way more stressful than for an adult. Okay? All right, make sense? That in bringing your kid into a movie theater is a little bit disrespectful to everyone else who came there to watch yeah, it. It really was less enjoyable. Like, I felt guilty watching this movie because there's little kids watching it too. Yeah. 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 yeah, the guy, the bad guy at the end gets eaten by dinosaurs because you know that happens to every movie, Jurassic movie, it doesn't give anything away. The, there's little kids in there that are cheering. Like this, <laughs> the proper solution to issues in the world. Talk, <laughs> like people. <laughs> right? Anyhow, okay. Um, this is the same stuff I remember, basically summary. Okay, whatever. This is a summary. You can read it on your own. Okay, so let's move into childhood. How does memory change in childhood? So obviously memory is getting much more advanced. Their explicit memory is very well developed. So from four or five years old on, the child's memory stores are functioning pretty much how they would function in adulthood. Now maybe the child's perception and interpretation of events may be different, but their memory stores are still there. So there's four major um, improvements that are happening. First is the change in basic capacity, so explicit memory is working. Um, the neurology of the brain has really developed and allows memory to be stored more efficiently, more space. Um, you can process the information faster, which of course you see with kids because they're getting things. That's because the brain is getting things. Then change in memory strategy, so how we get ourselves to remember things becomes more efficient. Um, and the older the child is, the better it gets. So they have better strategies for storing and retrieving information. It's organized better. It's organized around concepts and literally stored in the same areas of the memory source, which makes it faster to get. Um, you know, if you've got a memory store here and a memory store way over there, then to try to combine those memories for thinking or for retrieval or whatever, that's going to be very inefficient. So the older the kid gets, the better they are at storing and retrieving efficiently. Um, then, they, interestingly, they have increased knowledge about their own memory. So they understand memory. They know there is something called memory. They, un they begin to get understanding of how it works and how to use it. How do we study? How do we get things to store in our memories? Um, and as a parent, you need to make sure that you're teaching your kid how to study for things. Don't just assume you're going to naturally learn. Because look at yourself. Do you know how to study? Are you great at studying? Um, if you are, you probably have somebody teach you. Now, some people are just naturals and they're able to get it. But I'd say most people aren't like that. And then they also have increased knowledge about the world, and this is going to affect their memory. So they have more information to be learned, um, and they become more familiar with information. When you are in first grade and you get your first little test, um, this is a new thing for you. Well, I don't know, maybe nowadays we're testing preschoolers and kindergartens, which is stupid. But, um, but when you get your first exam, you don't understand an exam. You have to be taught what it is. You have to be taught, how do I know what's going to be on it? I mean, even in college, right? We all know that we don't know how a test is going to be given until we see the first one, right? Which is why I give you quizzes beforehand so that you can at least get an idea. 
But as soon as you get exam number one, now you're like, oh, now I know what to study for the next test. I know what the style of this test is. So the older you get, the more you understand how to understand. And you also start to develop frameworks for understanding. You have schema. So once you understand what a verb is, if new information comes in, it's really easy to just plug that in and move along. You don't have to completely build a new framework of understanding. Which you may have to, like if, who, who in here would say you're a really city person? Like animals, it's just livestock? No? Anybody familiar with cows? No, that's what I thought. Okay, kind of. So if you come out to my farm and I have you interact with a cow, you do not have a framework for cows. As a matter of fact, if you have a framework, it might be a bad one because you watch Ferdinand and you're like, oh, bulls are so sweet and nice. <laughs> I had somebody call me up and say, can I bring my kids out to snuggle with your cows? <laughs> are you insane? Okay. Besides tractors, cows are the number one cause of death for farmers. They are dangerous animals. So heck no, you cannot snuggle with my cows. I don't snuggle with my cows. Um, so you have a whole new framework to build for how to interact with this animal because you, you didn't grow up around them, you haven't had experience. And so you have a lot more to learn versus if you had been around cows all your life and somebody comes in and gives you a new bit of information, you just plug that in, move right along, you have a framework to understand it. Okay? If I learn new advanced psychology information, I have a very vast framework of understanding psychology. It's easy for me to retain that information because I plug it into the right spot and we're off the races. Whereas if you're taking your first psychology class, you have zero framework. Well, maybe not zero, because Freud is such a big part of our culture. But you know what I'm saying. All right, make sense? So the more information you have, the easier it is to learn. And it's e easier to know how to learn. OK. Um, so some other things that are happening um, into teenage years, short-term memory is improving, working memory, if you remember that, like how to think through and problem solve, that memory is increasing. This is especially with experience. Remember, just like Piaget said, there's a biological foundation, but it requires experience and input for it to develop. So since we're educating our children, this biologically they're capable and environmentally they're being trained, to develop these areas of the brain. So their short-term memory is um, especially improving. There are not improvements in long-term memory and sensory memory. Those are basically full-fledged by the time um, early childhood comes along, okay? which is interesting that short-term memory continues to improve. But think about it, it makes sense, right? Thinking about your own experiences in life. Your ability to think about something in the here and now is really what we're working on. I'm sitting here taking my test. I need to bring my information into sensory and so I can think about it and consider it. That's really the trick. Or, I'm sorry, I need to bring it into short-term memory, not sensory. Sorry. Forgive me. Um, <laughs> I need to think about it, have conscious awareness of it, and use my short-term memory. And while I have things in short-term memory, I need to be able to make connections to it and think things through, problem solving, and so on. So it's the short-term memory that we're really constantly working on. Um, and we see improvements in the capacity between 6 and 7 and 12 and 13. So these are the brain growth spurts. Okay? This is when we see big changes in the brain. Which is also when we have different schools starting. Kindergartners are different than elementary school students. And that's because the brain has physically grown and developed. That's why they're so different. When they hit puberty, we see vast differences between elementary and high school students. Okay. And we have middle school because if that growth spurt happens at different ages. So we just sort of combine them for a few years until everybody's hit enough development to move on to high school. And like I said, this is the physical maturation of the brain. The hippocampus especially um, is involved in memory. Hippocampus sort of supposedly looks like a horse. That's the hippo part. The hippopotamus is water horse. Hippo is horse. I don't know how it looks like a seahorse, but you can look at it yourself and see if that's the case. It's a little bit spiral. But. Um, hippocampus involves a lot of memory, especially being able to visualize things. So if you, if I try, if I tell you to picture a map of your neighborhood in your head, you're especially triggering your hippocampus. 
you have hippocampal damage, you're still able to remember things, but it's very hard to put a picture with it. So uh, if I ask somebody with damage to their hippocampus to imagine the beach, they may say, um, I see brown and blue, like the blue sky and the brown sand. And that's their story. If I ask a normal person, describe a beach to me, there's a crashing of waves, there's the calling of seagulls, there's umbrellas of different the colors, smell of the, sea. the smell of the sea. So this is a very visual, very imaginative part of the brain. And if that's damaged, you still have the memories, but all the details and the stories are gone. So it's, it's not that you've lost your memory, but you've lost your ability to efficiently use your memory. All right, so other things that are happening, we're becoming faster with our ability to think through things and process information. We're becoming more efficient, and of course this is short-term memory because this is what's really improving in childhood and adulthood. One thing that allows us to do is simultaneous mental processes, thinking of multiple things at the same time. And remember, we saw this with the conservation tasks. If I pour this water into another cup, are they different amounts of liquid? And prior to this mental development, the little kids in the pre-operational stage are saying, no, they're different. Concrete operations are like, no, it's the same thing. It's just because it's skinnier and taller doesn't mean that it's a different size. It's just a different shape. And so they're noticing multiple factors all at the same time. Um, mental, basic mental processes are becoming automatic, which frees up working space, which is important. You don't want to have to think through every, every single thing you do. If you have to think about your walking, then you're not going to be able to be contemplating the purpose of life at the same time, right? And little kids have to think about their walking. So those, those things are becoming automatic. Just like if you play any instrumental list in here, play the piano, what do you play? You play all instruments? No, I used to play the saxophone, piano, Okay, so if you're playing a saxophone or any other instrument, what do you play? Violin. So if you're thinking about where to put your bow and which strings to press and which keys to press or how to hold your mouth to make a sound, then you aren't focusing on how to make beautiful music. Right? It's only after that becomes automatic that now there's space in your brain for focusing on something like the sound of the music or the volume or whatever. I thought it was pretty cool playing violin. Playing violin. Yeah. I always wanted to play the violin, but I tried for a while and it just... Oh, my thing. You have to read two lines of music at the same time. Mm -hmm. I have to stop because I have a bachelor's, um, so every time I would lift it up, it would just be Yeah, piano did that to me. I, it hurt to play piano. Yeah. Flute, though? My mom put me a piano that's why I didn't like it. Yeah, I didn't like it either. <laughs> well, maybe it was a Everybody should have to learn how to play the piano, but... What was that? I went from piano to guitar. Piano to guitar? Did you, did you stick with guitar? No. no. I ended up going to football afterwards. Football, huh? Music to football. <laughs> Still, you got brain benefits from it, so everybody should put their kids in music. If you want your kid to be smart, put them in music. Don't push them to read at two years old. Get them into music. All right. Um, we basically talked about all of this. So the more information you have in each domain of learning increases the speed at which you can gain new information. Um, yeah. Um, choir class counts when Yes, although there are distinct um, advantages in instrumental music over vocal. But yeah, absolutely, there's nothing wrong with learning to sing. I think that's a fantastic thing. And anybody can learn how to sing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I stopped when the Well, maybe a few people can, but oh. a lot of people can. <laughs> At least basic. Yeah. Huh? There's 1% who are truly Yeah. My sister, the one with the memory. She's, she tries so hard, it's adorable, but. And there's only 1% of people in the world that can read music and play, you know, the musicians are kind of. Like perfect pitch, blind. is that what you're saying? No, who can read music. 1% of language, people? 1%. Wow, oh, that's horrifying. If that's yeah. true, that's horrifying. Yeah. Wow, how sad. You're part of the 1%. I am. I'm also part of the 1% for Actually, it's less than 1% for a PhD. I'm part of, I think it's 0.01% of the population has a doctorate. So, wow. we are the 0.01%. We are the few, the many. Um, <laughs> 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 we're the crazy who are masochistic to ourselves. 
Um, memory and encoding strategies develop in predictable order during childhood. Okay, so we see that there is, is this is a biologically programmed development. We are, our DNA determines how our memory progresses. So you cannot force your children to be smarter before they're capable of learning that information. So stop flipping out about having smart kids. There are age appropriate things you can do for your kids. Like if you have a two year old, let them go outside and play in the grass. Green vegetation is good for your intelligence. Brown vegetation, not so much. I mean, any nature is good, but research has proven that greenery is better for you than. We're living vegetation. in Apple Valley. Yes. <laughs> Big to the Take them to the park, take them up to the mountains, wherever they're going to see green. Water is also good, seeing water. Um, everything you don't have in the desert is good for your child. <laughs> But there, I mean, there are age-appropriate ways to develop the brain, even for little kids. But it's not trying to make your two-year-old read, or like my cousin trying to make your six-month-old read. Like that's just not. Why? Why would you even care about that at six-month-old? Um, we also see children start to increase their use of rehearsal. So remember that repeating items in order to keep it in short-term memory. So they start to develop that strategy. Um, they they get better at classifying things, categorizing. Um, and then also elaboration. Now this is one of the last memory strategies to develop in childhood. This is when they're trying to create meaningful links between items to be remembered. So remember what I said about the neurons. You need to make the more connections you can make, the easier it is to remember something. Because now any of those connections could activate the thing that you're thinking about. So we do naturally, and this strategy is programmed into our brain, we naturally start to develop the understanding that we need to make links. We need to understand something within the context, the broader context. What does this mean to me? What does this mean to science? What does this mean to my teacher? Whatever. Okay? And that's what we call elaboration. So we begin to get good at that. Some people better than others. And again, remember developmental psychology is about we need to understand what's normal so that we can optimize this. So if you know how memory develops in your child, you can help to develop those memory skills. Um, okay, so another thing with children is there are four um, phases to how they use their memory. So initially, children are having what is called um, mediation deficiency, where they can't, um, you can try to give them a memory strategy to use and they just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to them. So there's really no point. Like if you have a kindergartner trying to work on enhancing their memory, it's pretty pointless. They just they don't even understand what you're talking about. Once you get into elementary school years, they start to understand that. And this is what we call production deficiency. Uh, well, this is when they, they start understanding strategies, but only what has been taught to them. So we call that production deficiency. They're not they're not productive, basically is what it's saying. It's a weird term. But they are now able to use memory strategies. So you can teach them memorization, for instance. Teaching a kindergartner memorization. Possible, difficult. Preschoolers, really difficult. Below preschool, super difficult. They just don't get it. But the older they get into childhood, they get better and better at it. Early elementary school years and kindergarten, you can teach them this is how we remember things. I went to a Christian kindergarten, we memorized Bible verses. Lots of Bible verses. I remember, we did a, our kindergarten graduation, we had to recite a Bible verse for every letter in the alphabet. And we did it, no problem. Every kid did it. Um, but for us to come up with our own strategies on how to remember this stuff, our brain just wasn't capable of that. We understood the strategy that was given to us, but we weren't coming up with our own ways to remember things. So that's what we call production deficiency. Then we have utilization deficiency, where we can produce our own strategy. Um, but it generally is not helpful. It's an interesting thing. So kids come up with ways to remember things all the time. But they still end up going back to the old strategies, and that's actually what they use. For instance, my nephew is always coming up with like these sci-fi ways of doing things that don't work. He's got all these crazy ideas, but they don't work. So that's sort of what utilization deficiency is. We're coming up with our own thoughts, but they're just not super effective. And then we get into a phase where we can come up with our own strategies, and we benefit from using them. Now they become useful. So we're coming up with ideas. And now we, those ideas actually are good for something. And so we see that as memory develops for children, for the use of their memory, every single child goes through stages like this. So when your kid comes up with a stupid way of studying, 
don't harp on them about it. Like See? listening to music with words and yeah. loudly mm -hmm. on their yeah. Does, uh, that doesn't seem to be, I don't think that could be effective if you're, you got lyrics, you're music. singing along and you're writing, you're, are you really paying attention? Research to suggests that that is not good for learning, multitasking. It takes away brain use. However, there's some people that swear that it helps. Watching TV helps them to study. Mm -hmm. Did not help me. Um, but doesn't necessarily mean that. I mean, I, I think if we understand proper development, then it'll stop a lot of inappropriate shaming of our children. So, and, and utilization deficiency, we also have to remember that this is age dependent. So if your teenager is doing stupid stuff, that's different than if your six-year-old or your kindergartner is doing stupid stuff. So a teenager, they should be into the final stage where they are now producing and benefiting. They're effective. So if they're doing things that are ineffective, now it's appropriate to say, hey, there's a better way to do this. If your kindergartner is coming up with all of these crazy ideas, then you just pat them on the head and say, that's really cute. What about something else, too? And if they don't want to do it, you say, okay, well, you do it your way. And then you wait until they're a little older, and then you bop them across the head and say, hey, you need to do this right or you're not going to pass school. Okay, don't really bop them across the head. Okay? So this is why we study development, because there are certain things that are normal at different ages. We're doing on time. Uh, let's see. I think we're almost out of childhood. So let's just finish childhood and then we'll take a break. Um, we also have improvements in metacognition. You know, it's sort of a word nowadays. Say, oh, that's so meta. Has anybody heard that? <laughs> so meta. Um, so meta. When something is meta, you are thinking about the thing. It's not. It's not the thing itself. It's the philosophy regarding it. That's what it means to add meta to a word. Metaphysical is the philosophy of the physical world. And so that often involves like spirituality and things like that. Um, so metacognition is how we think about thinking. Which is sort of an interesting thing. But that's what we're doing in this class, right? We're thinking and talking about how we think and talk. So um, children um, they become, did I not skip to the next thing? Yes, I'm looking at that going, this is not right. What am I talking about here? Okay, so metacognition. So children develop the ability to understand the mind, to understand memory, to understand their thought processes. And they become better and better at it as they grow up. They become little psychologists. Okay? We're all natural psychologists. We all try to understand the world around us, try to understand ourselves and our relationships with people. And we become better as we get older. Now, like everything else, some people are really good at it naturally. Some people need a lot of help. Some people are terrible at it. Um, so it just depends on the child. But we all do start to improve in our understanding of the human dilemma. Um, now, if we have greater meta-memory, children have greater meta-memory, so understanding of memory, information about memory, they have better memory abilities. So one researcher, for instance, did a project where he taught children how memory works, and that dramatically improved their memory skills. Because once you understand how memory works, now you can manipulate your brain in order to remember things better. She just had a meta moment there, right? Her metacognition, her meta memory improved. Okay. So knowledge of memory and understanding how to mo monitor and regulate your memory processes enhances your ability to remember things. So this basically, this is all the fancy language for if somebody teaches you how to study, you become really good at studying. Right. Somebody teaches you how to remember things, you become better at remembering things. Okay. For instance, um, because I was in, in music, my teacher would taught me how to memorize a song. You practice it in this way. You, you go with short chunks of the song, and you memorize those before you add on to it. So that is a meta-memory sort of conversation. I learned the most efficient way to memorize something. Okay? So the more you learn about how to memorize, the better you get at memorizing, which is obviously, obviously makes sense, right? So don't just naturally expect yourself or your children to be great studiers. You need to teach them. Um, and then, like, this is sort of repetitive. The more you know in your area of expertise, the easier it gets to remember things. 
Um, so like if you're, if I give you an instrument to play for the first time, it's going to be really hard to remember technique and so on. But once you get good at it, I give you a new technique and you get it down like that. Um, makes sense. I think, is that it for this one? Yeah, and then just conclusions. Okay, uh, we'll, let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk more about the different aspects of memory and then we'll get into teenage years and... So, 9.43, let's come back at about 10, a couple minutes after 10.